Good morning and welcome back after a beautiful Pesach, Passover holiday that we just finished on uh, Thursday night. And when we finish Passover, we really begin the work of connecting not only to our own internal liberty of knowing that God Almighty took the Jewish people out of Egypt, the land of Egypt in the past, but it continues to do so every day. And every person has the opportunity to connect with that and not only connect with the opportunity for liberty, but also to connect to the giver of liberty. That's God Almighty. And when we know that we're being created by God Almighty at every instant, that every single cell in our body, every single breath is from God Almighty, it's an intimate relationship of creation and recreation at every single second, then we are now invested in making the choices that are going to allow us and lead us to the greatest expression of that liberty. We are, become, we are free from all the distractions in the world. We are free from all the distractions inside of us. We are free from all the negativity, the negative thoughts about ourselves, the negative thoughts about other people, what other people say negative about us. We are able to move past all of that and focus purely on the fact, the loving kindness of God Almighty, the fact that he's creating us intentionally at every moment. And we can bring that sense of liberty into the learning that we're doing with Rabbi Shtayf's holy book, Mitzvah Hashem, learning the commandments, the God Almighty's divine guidance for every single human being on what to stay away from, what enslaves us, what takes away our liberty. Well, what takes away our liberty is when we look to other things as our source of certainty, our source of confidence, our source of um, sense of security. You know, there's only two types of thoughts we can have. We can either have a secure thought or an insecure thought. Every thought that we have falls into one of those two categories. Now, if we have a secure thought, and that's a secure thought, is knowing that God Almighty is taking care of us, that everything is okay, it's exactly the way it's supposed to be, and he will continue to unfold our experience of reality in a way that's going to be for our, in our best interest, then we know and we can trust and we can feel certain that everything is, is the way it's supposed to be. But if we entertain an insecure thought, which could have a zillion different manifestations of insecure thoughts, whether it's about me or about the outside or about the people or, or what's going to happen or what I did in the past or what's the way things are now and comparing the way things are now to the way I thought they should have been. All these are insecure thoughts. When I go with an insecure thought, well, that's a very uncomfortable feeling. We know we're, we are entertaining an insecure thought automatically because our body has a visceral reaction, a feeling uh, that is the opposite of the feeling that we have when we have a secure thought. When we have a secure thought, we have a feeling of that certainty, that groundedness. It's a feeling that it, you could, if you see the word, uh, imagine the word feeling in all capital letters, it's a feeling, a knowing of God and God, knowing of God Almighty. And knowing that God Almighty is in you, it's it, that you are not separate from God Almighty, and knowing that you are part of his plan for you and for the entire creation, and he's taking care of you. That's a feeling that you know everyone has experienced that at some point in their life, but we tend to you know, then shift out of that and move into the entertaining the insecure thoughts. And when we entertain the insecure thoughts, we automatically have an immediate experience of tension, um, anxiety, it could be concern, fear, worry, guilt, remorse, all these different things are, are, are indications that we have gone off track, we're going into the insecure thinking. So what do you do when you are having a negative feeling, when you're feeling inside of yourself, something is off, something is wrong, um, you're not sure, you look for things to make you feel better. So, for example, if you were to um, start to worry, what's going to be tomorrow? Are you going to have a job tomorrow? Well, that's an insecure thought because I don't know if I, I'm going to have a job tomorrow. If you're going to have a job tomorrow, there's no way to know. Um, as we're going to learn together after we get through the um, ways in which we try to cope with insecure thoughts that are negative insecure thoughts, that, that are negative ways, inappropriate ways to deal with insecure thoughts. We're going to learn next week, we'll learn about being simple and, and, and straightforward with our creator, with God Almighty. 
where when we have an uncomfortable thought, we recognize it's it's an indication that we are um, we are we are entertaining an insecure thought, which is telling us, it's reminding us, it's um, clarifying for us that we are dis we are not conscious of our connection to God Almighty. We're not aware of our con connection to God Almighty. So, what's the obvious thing to do? Well, bring back my attention to my connection to God Almighty. That's what this um, immediate response system of discomfort from an insecure thought is meant to do, to make me aware, ah, I am off track. Let me get back on track with my connection to God Almighty. Now, if a person doesn't go that direction and instead they take their, their, um, their, their discomfort and they say, oh, I don't know, I thought came into my mind. I don't know if I can have a job tomorrow. Well, let's go and let's try to figure that out. How can we figure that out? Well, mankind has devised numerous ways to try to figure these things out. People try to read, let's say, for their horoscope. They go to astrologers. They can go, and we're going to see that there's sorcerers, soothsayer, necromancers, and so forth. We started to discuss that last week. But we also discussed prior to that the concept of a person turning his children over to the priestly cult of Melech because they would promise that everything's going to be okay. So... There, a person is not necessarily not looking for the details of how they're going to be okay, but they're looking for the promise. If they can get the promise, they're willing to do anything, including sacrificing their own children, in return for the promise that their kids are going to be okay. So we have to recognize that when we have an insecure thought and we take it, took it seriously, we can go turn back to God Almighty and say, okay, I got the point. I got off track over here. Or we can get distracted by looking... Uh, for ways to cope and manage that that uncomfortable feeling that comes of having entertained the insecure thought and and letting it fester within ourselves, and then we go off into things that are God is saying these are forbidden. Don't go after these type of sorceries. Don't go after these types of future telling um, activities because they're taking you further away from God Almighty. The fact that you had the insecure thought in the first place, well, you can't control what's going to come into your, your mind. But you took it seriously, that's the first problem. And now instead of going back to your source, back to your creator, now you're going further, you're perpetuating the problem, increasing the problem by trying to go to somebody else who has some sort of formula, sorcery formula, to tr tell you what's going to be. And there's two problems that one is you are now turning away from God and looking for things to make you feel secure other than the, your knowledge of your connection with God Almighty. And the other problem we've discussed is that you're creating a priestly cult of people who know and have the skills to get you this information. And instead of having a direct relationship with your creator, you're now trying to figure out the future by interacting with these types of forbidden practices. So therefore, God Almighty is telling us, don't go to these practices. And so what I want to encourage you to do when we're learning this together is not really to say to yourself, well, I, I would never do that. I'm not going to go to someone who's going to go speak to the dead to, um, to uh, find out the future, but rather to use this as an opportunity to say, in what ways am I doing the things that the, entertaining the insecure thoughts that while I might not go and do something like go ask someone to speak to the dead or even go to a fortune teller or something like that, I try to get the answers, but I'm doing other things to try to calm my um, sense of knowing everything that's going to be. Um, like Just as an example, I'll just throw this out there. So I'm, not, I'm not saying that it's forbidden, but it falls into the same... Um, attempt to try to manage our future. What if a person is extremely um, micromanaging his planning for the coming week and he feels from, from the chaos and the calm, uh, from, the, from the chaos and, the, and of all the things that need to be done. So now he feels grounded. He feels better because he has a whole list of all those things to do and he's got it down to the, you know, very, very precisely scheduled. Well, he's doing something. He's got creating like a crutch that he's now telling his own future. He knows he's going, he's going to do it every time. Well, what he's done is he's excluded the possibility that he might have a call that's going to come in that's going to be taking his attention, require his attention ahead of everything else. He's now, and, and he could then 
go even more into the descent of when he gets that call or some he needs his, his family needs help from him he'll be very, very frustrated very upset because now he's getting thrown off that sense of uh, that false sense of security that he created through his scheduling so there's an example and that we could you know i'm sure people could post other examples and get a chance to discuss it but this is this is what we need to do to to recognize that we shouldn't look at these people who are going after these um these uh, what we might call primitive ways of uh, ascertaining the future and say ah you know they, they're they're so off track well the fact of the matter is we are also on a moment by moment basis facing the exact same challenges that they're facing we're facing the exact same um tendency to try to take an insecure thought seriously and then propel us into an attempt a, a desperate attempt you know we're flailing around um, drowning in this sense of uncertainty and the unknown, and then we're trying to find get means to, to grab onto something that we then turn into our rock. And that tends to be as anything other than God Almighty. It could be food, it could be uh, someone's going to tell us it's going to be okay, or we could do an incantation, we could do a scheduling, we could just throw up our hands and, and just go into paralysis, we could say we're not going to do anything um give up all kinds of ways that we could um, try to cope with the sense of uncertainty unknown and overwhelm what we've talked about before is that god is in the unknown what i think i know is the very very limited glimpse at a tiny fraction of reality and it may not even be correct what i and, and nothing nothing is going nothing new is going to come to me from what i already know on the contrary, the God Almighty is in the un unknown. That's where the answers lie. And that's where I need to be willing to go with confidence that I'm going into the unknown in my uh, creative imagination, in my thinking, in my insights, going into the unknown in my relationships, going into the unknown in my uh, activities in the world, and knowing that God Almighty is with me in that unknown and that my rock is God Almighty. That's where. We want that's what we want to develop in ourselves. So that's how we are constantly re bringing us back into um, into that state of groundedness. And what I spoke about at the on, on the last day of Pesach, on the last day of Passover, Achan Shal Pesach, is that in this time of exile, well, we all have that inner tranquility. We all have that inner knowing, but we're constantly being thrown curveballs. Of, of different things. Well, what about the weather? What's What about the stocks? What about the finances? What about this relationship? What about that relationship? What about this thought I just had? What about the future? What, what did I do in the past? All these things are constant, like um, we're being peppered with um, all these curveballs of different things that we now have to say, I refuse to go down the track of thinking about these things. I refuse to go take these insecure thoughts seriously. These are all insecure thoughts. What I what I want to do is keep grounding myself, bringing myself back to that inner tranquility of knowing that God has been taking care of me. God Almighty is taking care of me and will continue to take care of me. That's what I need to keep coming back to, bringing myself back to with every new curveball. Instead of trying to fight the curveball, instead of trying to figure out the curveball, I need to now just go back to that inner tranquility. Well, when Mashiach comes, that's we we won't have those curveballs anymore. We're just going to constantly be residing in that state of tranquility, which is already innately built into us by God Almighty because He is our source. He is the ultimate in tranquility. So now let's turn to what Rabbi Steif was telling us over here, and I'm going to just by um, way of of uh, reminding us bring up over here the verse from the book of Deuteronomy, from Devarim, over here, we have chapter 18 in Deuteronomy, verse 10 and 11 are the two verses that we are focused on right now. That's verse 10. Should not be found in you. Someone is going to turn uh, your son uh, or daughter into the fire. That's the fire of Melech, the priestly cult of Melech. Kesem Kesamim is a, a soothsayer, Ma'inen, a divin diviner of auspicious times, a Menachesh, someone who interprets omens, and a Machashef is a sorcerer. Then verse 11 says, 
person who is a charmer, the shoyal oyiv, a person who is a hitham sorcerer, and a shoyal yidei, it's a verse says v'yidaini, it's also shoyal yidaini, um, yidei sorcerer, v'yidei shalamesim, a necromancer. So last time we discussed the um, shoyal oyiv and shoyal yidaini, and now we're going to go back to here to kaisem kasomim to a soothsayer. So let's pull up over here the um, text of Rabbi Steif's Mitzvah Hashem, and we will see over here are on page 337, Shin Lamed Zayin. And now we have over here, this here is 338. Um, we're going to bring up 337. We'll bring them all up and we'll sort it out once they're here. Okay, here we go, 337. Okay, so we're up to chapter 14 over here. I'm sorry, we did chapter 14 last time. We're up to chapter 15. Shalolik Saim, not to be a um, soothsayer. That's how we translate it over here. Okay, so let's go. Um, this is corresponds to the Sefer Achinoch, Mitzvah Tov Uf Yud, which is 510. Aleph, paragraph one, Shnemar, like it says in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 10, Don't, you should not be found among you, the uh, person who is a soothsayer. What does it mean, a, a soothsayer? He takes a stick that's a staff in his hand and he hits it on the ground many times. And he screams various um, different shouts and screams. And he leaves uh, different, all kinds of different uh, thoughts he has. And he looks in the ground, like he goes to like as a mental trance of thoughtlessness. And he stares in the ground for a long period of time. The magi to see this until there comes some sort of like um almost like a person fallen into a sick trance and he says he now relates the future some do it with sand and some do it with stones or or arts where he throws some type of um of leather to the um, ground, or and he hold, or he holds a, a um, staff in his hand, and he uh, he inquires, uh, and he says, should I, I if I should go, or should I not go? I call the clock of some, and this is all a soothsayer. He's trying to decide that people want to know, should I go on a trip? Is this going to be a good fortune? Am I going to make money? Is it going to be dangerous? And so forth. So he's trying to be a suit, getting um, this information from a soothsayer. And this is how he does it. Maramam say from mitzvahs, lo yitas in lam and aleph. This is a reference here to the Rambam. Uh, Maimonides in the book of mitzvahs, the negative commandments, number 31. The Sefer mitzvahs, Hashem hevi oid, and in the book of mitzvahs, Barai brings out, uh, or, or, or more examples. Um, when he's going to go up on a trip, uh, first he goes to soothsayers, and he takes um, different um, sooth, it's like he takes um, different soothsaying from, um, from wood. So he takes these sticks and he peels them on one side. And on the other side, he um, puts, he leaves the, he leaves the uh, klipa, he leaves the, the bark on the wood. So he takes a, you take a stick and one side you peel off the bark, on the other side you leave the bark. And he takes these, uh, these um, soothsaying sticks, and he throws them from his hand. If he is going to, um, if he, if they fall, the sticks fall in a way that this, the bark is uh, upwards. This is a sign. This, this is this is a ish. This is a simon tave. This is a um, sign of a good thing. 
should go on his way. And he should go and do the, um, he should go ahead and do the thing that he desires to do. And this is, um, this is a called being a soothsayer and uh, someone who does this receives lashes. And then chapter, paragraph two over here, Hashel Kulkesim, and um, also he quotes this from Sefer Mitzvah Hashem. Someone who asks um, a soothsayer, he receives uh, lashes of um, rebellion. Okay, so now that's, uh, we've finished page 337, and we're going to continue on page, page 338. Okay. Simon Tezayin, chapter 16, Sholul uh, Hashif, this is based on the Chinuch, Tafkuf Yud Aleph, this is 511. Go back over here, we see Luchashif Kishuf is sorcery. Okay, this is the word over here. Do not do sorcery. Um, Aleph. Paragraph one, like it says, like in the verse that we quoted from in Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 18, verse uh, 10, should not be found among you, as someone who does sorcery. The concept of Kishuf, who a person uses various types of herbs, various types of grasses and stones. Different things from things that people use uh, this with this. These type of things. The person who does sorcery is uh, it's a capital crime and is high of stoning, is, is obligated to being stoned. And a person who asks a sorcerer is. Uh, he is a recipient of uh, lashes of rebellion, meaning to say he has rebelled against God Almighty. He's done the wrong thing, even though he did not do the sorcery. But he, since he went and inquired of the sorcerer to find out the information, therefore he is uh, given his lashes. So you can see how serious this is. And um, there are many, many different things that people do to try to get to these types of um to get these kind of answers. Um, we're going to see more over here. So now uh, we see next in chapter 17, we go back over here, we see that this is a charmer. Okay, so here in verse uh, 11, chapter 18 of Deuteronomy, uh, um, this corresponds to the Sefer Chinuch, mitzvah, Tav Kuf Yud Beis, which is 512. Aleph, paragraph 1, Shnemar. Again, quoting the same verse. In the Torah, Lo Yitimza B'cho, B'chei V'chover. Who should, what does it mean, this type of thing which we're calling a charmer? Who should melachesh devarim she'enu lo am? He whispers different um, formulaic sayings that are not uh, what people say generally, it's not like phrases that people are the lotion of am, meaning to say the, the speech of, of people in general. And he says different incantations or different uh, state, different things in, in some sort of bizarre, un, unusual uh, language. Malachish al and he and he says this charming on a snake or al akrav or on a, a scorpion, shalo yazik, that the scorpion should not harm him. Uh, or harm people. Purush, meaning to say, he's quoting from the Rambam in the uh, 11th chapter of the Laws of Idolatry, the 10th uh, Halacha, and also Rashi in his commentary on the Talmud Sanhedrin on page 65, <clears throat> side one, side Aleph. Purush, so he like creates this um, relationship with these. Um, he connects with these wild animals or with these um, like uh, lowly insects through this incantation. 
this whispering. Um, uh, there are those that hold in their hand at the time of this whispering, at the time of this incantation, um, a stone or something, a key or a stone, and a kol kol every every form of this, whatever it is, is forbidden. Um, person who's going to do this, um, he's hold, holding his hand anything, uh, or does some sort of activity while he's um, saying these things, then that is he receives lashes. Even if he just lifts his finger and just points with his finger. Or he nods or um, or he um, does some form of acknowledgement towards an object. Then he is going to be, uh, he receives lashes. So, initial business, someone who asks uh, for this type of activity to happen, he receives the lashes of rebellion. And also, a person who does this type of, um, this type of charming is, uh, receives lashes of rebellion. Even if I'm saying this person does this type of charming without any action on his part, he just does the charming, then this is called um Marcus Mardis. This is he, he's I'm not sorry, it's called not called Marcus. He's going to receive lashes of rebellion. Okay, now uh I know I'm going through this um relatively quickly. I want to get through the God willing, the last of these chapters today, uh, that's talking about this series of prohibitions. And um, then if we'll try to get to questions today, if we can't, then we will um, get to questions next week. But I want to be able to go next week to start with the Tamim Tiyu Imavayla Kecha, to be simple and straightforward with the Lord your God. Chapter 18, Shaloli Dorosh Alamesim. Now, don't go be a necromancer. Don't go literally Dorosh means to seek from the dead. Chinuch Tafkuf Tesvav. This is corresponds in the Sefer Chinuch to the mitzvah 515. Aleph Shenemar, again, the same, uh, like it says in the Torah, the same verses. Shouldn't have someone who seeks from the dead. This is a person who um, starves himself. He, he doesn't eat. And um, he then goes to sleep in the cemetery. In order that a dead person should come to him in a dream, and he will tell him the answer to that which he is inquiring about. Rambam, this is quoting the Rambam in the 11th chapter of the laws of idolatry in the 12th law. And it says in... Um, the Sefer Yerim in Simon in chapter 335. He writes over there, the person who makes this a sick person who's on his deathbed to take, well, but while he's alive, to take an oath that he will come back after he dies with the answer to a question to so to tell over the answer to the question so he's going to die and then he's going to go um into the next world and he's going to take this mission and ask a question in the where these things are known and he's going to come back with what is the answer this ain't the dirish this is not called um inquiring of the dead he says over here that this uh, inquiring of the dead is talking about the body of the dead person the daber uh, uh, and, and talks about um, through sorcery, like we talked about this in the previous classes, they take the, the dead person out of his um, grave. Or try to get the person out of his grave is that and this one is still this here 
um, this is um, uh, the, this the talking to the, the person while they're still in this this necromancing is taking while the person is still in the grave. But if a person is not so, so, there's two types of dealing with the dead. Three types of dealing with the dead. There's dealing with the dead that is um, is tr actually bringing the dead body out of the grave. There's dealing with the dead while the body is still in the grave. And then there's dealing, trying to talk to the dead person, but not dealing with his body. Um, it's like trying to, not to, not, but here's the distinction. The, the distinction being made here is instead of talking to the dead body, you're talking to the spirit of the person who's dead. So it's saying over here that seeking out the spirit is trying to talk to the spirit of the person is not called communicating with the dead. Because the spirit is not called dead. And this we say in the Talmud of Baruchas in the 18th chapter, side two, uh, 18th page, side two. Um, the story about a man who was, he went and he slept in the uh, cemetery. And we're now at the top of 330, uh, 339. Shein Lamates. hear two voices talking to each other, two spirits. And also Shmuel asked his father, um, who had passed away, about the money of um, uh, money belonging to um, orphans, where it was placed. Uh, so the the distinction over here. So let's go. Keep going here. But I am the Now this is going a little bit into a discussion about which part of these is really seeking after the dead, and what's what's forbidden. So in a commentary on the Sefer Yireim and the Teifus Reim. Uh, he writes over there, This that the Sefer Yireim says that someone who is seeking after the spirit of the per dead person, not his body, is not called uh, necromancing. So, uh, in this tract uh, of the Talmud, Nida, Yud Zion, on an Aleph, the 17th page, the first side. There's five things a person does that causes him to be culpable for his own soul. A person who goes and sleeps in the cemetery and that in order that should be resting upon him the spirit of impurity. That the mesaskin Sorry, this chasnin le adkan. The tipuk le shehu bechlal doyish lemesim. So he comes to the conclusion that these things are actually included in seeking the dead. The bezet asi shaper, and this comes out much better. That is, even though it's dealing with the spirits, it's also a problem. Miyash she bezet hayirim mama shehikshalav habeisisa biyordeya, and he answers this uh, what the yirim is saying by the questions that are raised by the Beis Yosef in his commentary on the tour in the section of the Shulchan Aruch, section of Code of Jewish Law, Yoradea, Sumen Kuf Ayin Tess in the 179, Tzayin Kanati, Simon Ketav Kuf Samafav, Ayin Sham Meshach Kuf Ayin Tess, Sif Kotten Tess Zayin Adkan. What he's uh, the base Yosef says over there is that this was not a case. The story about the man who went to the um, uh, cemetery and he slept in the cemetery and he heard these voices. This is not um, at all uh, referring to a person who was going there to hear these voices. Actually, he says that what the Gemara is talking about, the Talmud is talking about a man who got his wife was upset at him and she basically he was he was embarrassed and his wife was upset with him and he didn't want to go tell anybody. Um, and, you know, go to sleep in a friend's house. So he didn't want anyone to know. So he went and slept in the cemetery. And while he was there, he heard spirits speaking. So it wasn't that he went for the purpose of that. So you can't learn out that therefore it's acceptable. And in, in general, the base series, if he also has a distinction, but the story with Shmuel, which is, I, I was learning this yesterday in preparation for this learning. And I, I'm not recalling exactly what his distinction was about the story with Shmuel and asking his father about the money, what the assuming, but, um, 
but basically he says over there this concept that the basis base yosef says that this concept is somehow a distinction between speaking to the body of the dead person and speaking to the spirit of the dead person is a is a mistaken uh confused idea and um these these stories of where a person was speaking to the or listening to the spirits of people um is not proof at all that it's okay to do that on the contrary to go and seek that is is forbidden even if you're speaking or seeking of the spirit of the person but i am the and see also in the yerim uh shanira the devour of the whole elu halavim even aid gam al halav so in addition to the to the yerim says over here that uh it appears that all, in addition to the prohibitions that we just said over here that it's forbidden to do these different things god we're also a person who does these things is transgressing on the prohibition that says there's also a prohibition not prohibition not to go in the ways of the um nations that transgress and, and practice idolatry and go against god almighty god almighty don't go in their ways so person is is not only involved in these uh, sorcery practices which is a direct prohibition but in addition he is um following the ways of the wayward nations Paragraph two, base. Uh, a person who does some sort of action after uh, the body of the dead person comes and he then um, is informed of something um, that is also he receives lashes. See the Rambam uh, there in the uh, 13th Halacha and Rashi on. Um, the um, Torah portion, Shaftim, in Deuteronomy, Yud Ches, Yud Aleph, Kasha Shagoyin Shemayla, Bisichoyse, Venisha Begogelis. Let's look this up over here. We're going to um, Rashi right over here, and we'll pull up. If we go up here, we can pull up Rashi, show the Rashi's commentary, and we go back to verse. Um, so it says over here, as what does it mean, Nikuman? So one who raises the dead spirit upon his member, meaning the male member, the male organ, or one who consults a skull. These are examples that Rashi is bringing here um, as, as uh, of necromancy. So final paragraph of Enoch Siv is written in Devarim, Chapter 18, verse 12. Let's go over here. Um, whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out from before you, meaning the nations, the Canaanite nations that were practicing these types of activities. And as Rashi says, it doesn't say he does all these things, but even one of these things is an abomination to God Almighty. So, um, it's because they did these abominations that God is sending them out. It's understood from this that non-Jews are also warned in all these matters not to do these things. Because the non-Jews of who lived in the land of Canaan, in the Holy Land, they were punished and, and evicted from the land because of these practices. So therefore, they must be forbidden to do them. This is touching back on a discussion we've had before. That Yossi lists all these prohibitions. In this verse, is also applying to the non-Jews. Um, in the tractate, in the, uh, the Talmud, uh, 57 Verse two, the Bnei Noach mitzvah al kishuf that non-Jews are commanded against sorcery. Anu lo kaimalan kain, and then we'd had the discussion that we don't we don't follow this way. Meaning to say, when the Rabbi Shteif had resolved it that we do hold that is prohibited, but it's not one of the seven capital crimes. The Kasa b'Torah is tamima, and it's written in the Torah tamima. Sheim kain saif loim ashirim nei shakodesh rong soinik shafim the fee she. So if it's not that they're, so the question would be, if you're saying going to say that they're not prohibited in it, then why were they uh, punished for it? 
And uh, we'd have to say that because the Holy One, blessed be he, hates sorcery um, because it it's contradicts the, you know, the the Kamali um, Shomayla, meaning to say like the heavenly hosts. Al-Kain, Hashem Harisham Ad Khan, therefore, Hashem uh, threw them out of the land, meaning to say even if they weren't, it's just a thing that God hates, even though they weren't commanded not to do it. That's would be the, what you'd have to say if you say they're not commanded. Uh, not prohibited in that commandment. So at the very least, we can see that prove that God Almighty hates these things. And therefore, at least according to what makes sense, they're a non-Jew, the children of Noah should prevent themselves from doing these things. So they should not cause that God Almighty will cause them to be destroyed because of the, the abominations that they're involved in. So he's bringing a different angle over here. The, the angle that we discussed in the previous times was to say, um, okay, maybe they're not uh, commanded and not prohibited in these things, uh, but meaning to say it's not listed in the capital crimes, but they're still prohibited anyways. Now he brings another aspect, which is even if they're not prohibited at all, and it's just because God Almighty despises these activities, and therefore he punished the people that were in the land of Israel and the Canaanites, and, and it just sent them and had them destroyed and sent them to the land of Israel. Well, that itself is a good enough reason for a non-Jew to understand that this is not something that he should be participating in, that's you could use what makes sense, the, the uh, a, a sensible statement over here, Mitzat Svara, that since it makes sense to say that, that since it's the possible reason that he he uh, he punished those nations is not because they violated a particular command, but because they did things that were disgusting to God, and that go against God. That therefore they were destroyed. So it makes that it's a sensible point to make that every non-Jew would want to avoid doing these things because he doesn't want himself uh, or his people to be destroyed um, as a result of doing these things. So um, that's why um, that's why that that therefore it's just, we can learn from this that we have to understand that when we're learning the laws that apply to the non-Jews, even if there's a debate and discussion as to what is the category, what is the status of that particular law, we have to understand that it still would apply to the non-Jew not to get involved in something that God Almighty is going to be despising. There's no reason that whatsoever a person would want to come even anywhere close to that, even if it's not a prohibition um, for the non-Jews. So both the Jews and the non-Jews have to understand this because uh, a Jewish person who's learned would actually runs the greater risk of getting confused on these matters because he's going to say, "Oh, sorcery and and uh, these different things, the necromancy and so forth." Well, Rabbi Yosi suggested in the Talmud that these are forbidden, but the we like Kaimalan came, we don't learn that way. So therefore, he gets confused and he thinks maybe it's something that's uh, not prohibited to the non-Jew. And therefore, he's when he's going to discuss it either with other Jews or with a non-Jew, he's not going to understand that it's prohibited. He's going to teach it incorrectly and say it's not prohibited. So Rabbi Steif is coming to say, even if you were to reach the conclusion it's not prohibited as a it's not a specific commandment that applies to the non-Jew not to be involved in each one of these de, uh, these aspects of of trying to uh, get answers about the future and answers to questions. Nevertheless. The mere fact that God Almighty despises it is enough to inform every human being that this is something that they should not get involved in. Um, question posted over here, why do Jews go to Tzfas to pray by the graves of the uh, Kabbalah rabbis like uh, Rabbi Luria and more? So first of all, um, it's not just Tzfas, it's not just Kabbalah rabbis, it's uh, every, everybody goes to this uh, grave site, it's, uh, a person goes to the, should go to the grave site of their parents. Um, um, at least once a year before the yurt site, before the anniversary of their parents' passing, and pray at the gravesite of the parents. Um, the person should go to the gravesite of their teacher or their rebbe, um, and it, it has nothing to do with what particular um, what the what the particular teachings of that person were. So this is something that is universal among the Jewish people, um, and is and is a good practice. And in fact, it even says that um, in terms of preparing for Rosh Hashanah that. Person going to um, grave sites is something that is 
going to bring about the fear of God upon a person. And if a person is living in an area where there are no Jewish graves, he could even go to a non-Jewish grave in order to have that sobering experience of recognizing the uh, fragility of life and that we are only here temporarily in this physical world. So we go to the grave sites of people in order to pray. We go to the grave sites in order to um, have a sobering experience of, of the of significance of, of being alive in, in, in God's world and doing God Almighty's um, instructions for us and, and, and loving commandments for us. But in terms of praying at the sites of particularly rich, righteous people where there draws um, a lot of people to come and pray, we're not praying, God forbid, to the person. We're not asking the person for answers. We're not asking the person to um, you know, tell us the future at all, God forbid. Person is going to pray at the sight grace of a righteous person, and 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 because the belief is that the righteous, there we can we can pray and ask the souls of those righteous people who are in in, in the heavenly abode in the uh, world to come to intercede on our behalf to um, speak up, so to speak, and and ask for divine compassion for the rachamim on God's people. And on whatever matter a person is going to pray about, whether it's in a specifically, uh, you know, a relationship matter, or it's a about a child matter with children, or a matter of health, or a matter of income, and the person is going to to say, please, uh, God Almighty, in answer my prayers and the merit of this person who's over here, um, this great righteous person, um, hear my prayers in their merit because I myself may not have any merit. I myself may be stumbling around in the confusion of life, but here's a person who um, conducted himself properly, who stayed on track throughout his whole life and was a, uh, an example to other people. And in his merit, you should listen to his, you should listen to my prayers in his merit. And some people will say, you know, that, that uh, there's praying at a righteous person's grave that they also in, in the heavenly abode where all the souls are gathered, that they should be some active intercession um, by the souls. But a person could also do that by their parents. Um, you know, ask their parents to to help intercede in a particular um, thing. It's, but we're not speak. We're not. We're not having a. Um, we're not. We're not looking for answers for the future. Um, yes, absolutely. We can go to the Marat uh, Machpelah in Hebron. Um, yeah, the Martha of Chela, that's the gravesite of Avram, uh, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and their wives, and also Adam Arishan is buried there, um, and his wife, Chava. Uh, yes, we should, people should definitely go to these places, these are great holy places, um, and, and pray there. Yeah, so when we take names, we're taking names of people that we're praying for to the, to the gravesite of a person. Um, we are taking them to Hashem, we're taking them to God Almighty. We, we're just adding, that these are the people that we're seeking beseeching God Almighty to have mercy on them. Um, and we're just taking a name to remind ourselves of the names of the people that we want to that God Almighty should have mercy um, on the Tokhshar Amisrael amongst all the Jewish people and amongst the entire humanity that God Almighty should have mercy on this entire, have divine compassion on every single, every single human being. Okay. Uh, please Let's continue next week with questions. I want to pause right now. Um, if you have specific questions, you got to email them to me in advance on this subject. And next week, we'll start chapter 19. In addition to answering any questions, we, um, we will go and uh, into now, how are we supposed to conduct ourselves? The positive commandment. We've dealt with all the negative commandments. Don't go after this answer. Don't go after this way of getting an answer. Don't go after this way of trying to create your certainty. Um, and uh, we'll be continuing next week. Yes, we should go to the part of Marach Tampela in the merit of Avon Avino to answer the question over here. Yes, absolutely. Um, that's that's uh, that's why it's something that we make that effort to travel there and to, to go there and pray there. It's such a special place to pray. Okay, God bless you all. See you next week. Take care. <laughs>